brands, agencies, and marketers. And we have a wonderful panel. I'd like to welcome everyone. We have Rishi Chala, head of gaming at Twitter. We have Cameron Kelly, Chief Marketing Officer at Complexity Gaming. We have Felix Lahey, founder and CEO of United Esports and my lead esports talent, uh, esports agent at United Talent Agency. Yes, talent. Welcome, thank you all uh, for being here. We have our moderator, I'd like to welcome you as well, Gunnar Hamilton, uh, managing partner at Driver Ventures. Please. Thank you. Um, well, thank you guys for coming. Uh, I'm Menard, your moderator. Uh, I am particularly excited for the panel today because I think our host did a great job of pulling our panelists from the different kind of verticals involved in esports. And so we have someone from a platform, someone from a team, um, someone from an esports agency, uh, and someone from a talent agency. Um, it's my job to kind of get them talking, so I'm going to ask them to make quick introductions about why what they do is sort of relevant to answering this question about brands and sponsors in esports, and then we'll uh, get going with the question. So why don't we just move down, starting with you, Felix. Um, hey, I'm Felix. I'm the founder of United Esports. Uh, what we do is we provide media and marketing services to brands that are trying to get into esports or further in. Uh, at first, we're only doing non-endemic brands, but now we do a mix of both, you know, companies that you wouldn't think uh, would be associated with esports, like CPG, health, uh, women's products, and so on, as well as gaming companies. And what's CPG? Uh, consumer package goods. Sorry. Um, so yeah, so we try and uh, help them with their esports strategies. We do uh, executions, and I'm proud to say with the agency a record for for esports and gaming for a couple companies. Great. Uh, my name is Rishi Chada. I'm the global head of gaming content partnerships at Twitter. Uh, I work with publishers and developers, esports teams, gaming personalities, uh, and even brands on how they build their audience on the platform, how they're engaging with their audience on the platform, and then also how they monetize and build a business on Twitter. Yeah, I'm Cam Kelly. I'm the CMO at uh, Complexity Gaming. Uh, most of y'all probably know us as the Cowboys esports team, the Dallas Cowboys esports team. So head up content, marketing, social, creative, brand, um, and a bunch of other stuff. So we operate teams in about 12 different games globally, um, and that changes all the time. Uh, my name is Mike Lee. Um, I'm an esports agent over at UTA. We represent around 90 different esports personalities, ranging from pro players across <coughs> League of Legends, Counter-Strike, um, Fortnite, you know, you name it, Hearthstone, um, all the way to the top Twitch, Mixer, YouTube, and Facebook streaming personalities. Great. Um, so to start off, just generally, what do you guys consider the best brand activations of the last year, and kind of why you think it, 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 it merits kind of highlighting it the best? Well, anyone? I like what Mountain Dew's been doing with the Game Fuel launch. Uh, they've been tapping into an endemic audience and allowing them to, you know, use their voice and their personalities and let that shine. So, uh, can you tell a little bit more? Yeah. Like what they did. And so the most recent one was with a, a guy named Courage JD, uh, Jack Dunlop. He was a Call of Duty caster who's now more of an online gaming personality and streamer. And they actually created a. Um, they did like one of the launch uh, promo commercials with him where it really like played into his personality of just kind of being a goofball, but also allowing like, and letting him have fun with it and kind of speak in his own tone, uh, but also promoted the product that they're trying to launch and build awareness around. So I think that's just like the general sentiment you'll see across the board with a lot of these successful campaigns is really tapping into the team, the brand, the influencer, and letting them use their tone and, and speak in their own language. Uh, is, is Courage associated with a... He's, he, he's associated with 100 Thieves. So, and, he's but sponsored this, by Red Bull. He's also, he's also <laughs> sponsored by Red Bull. So it's an interesting dynamic, but individually he's got a partnership with Game Fuel, and so he's been able to do stuff with that. Yeah, and just to echo that, I mean, Mountain Dew, we're, we're in the midst of helping them plan the year two, so I think they're just taking a deeper dive into esports, um, you know, kind of echoing what Rishi said, you know, last year they sponsored CDL, or the Call of Duty League, or last year they sponsored Call of Duty World League, and they'll continue to sponsor Call of Duty League this year, um, but, you know, they're one of the few brands that have actually uh, sponsored leagues, Teams like Optic last year, this year I believe they're sponsored like COG, they sponsored individuals like Courage, and um, you know, upcoming for the year two, you're gonna see them branching off into other areas within esports that we're hopefully gonna announce in a week or two. Great. To me, the, the most interesting sponsorship of the last year is uh, by far the Louis Vuitton uh, sponsorship of League of Legends. Uh, I think it really shows how 
we, you know, and I didn't work on it, so it's an unbiased opinion. Uh, but what they did, you know, Riot's team and League of Legends uh, decided that they, they really sh understood how their audience overlaps. Because Louis Vuitton, at the end of the day, doesn't really care as much to sell to the Western markets anymore. They really want to sell to what they perceive as their new markets in the Middle East and Asia. And League of Legends is one of the most popular, if not the most popular, esports in China, which is a really big expansion market for uh, Louis Vuitton. So in short, what they did is that they created in-game assets, so you could buy skins for your characters that were Louis Vuitton. They put the trophy in a Louis Vuitton case, and they made a collection that you could buy in stores uh, that was a Louis Vuitton connection, collection uh, League of Legends themed, and it sold out in less than 24 hours. So I think that's the most interesting one because it shows that people are like, what, a brand like Louis Vuitton and eSports, a bunch of dudes in their basements? It's not a bunch of dudes in a basement. It's actually a really interesting and lively market that has uh, global reach and uh, engagement. So it sounds like they were really sort of thoughtful about how do we reach the end audience. Yeah, I mean, they understood that there was a huge overlap. Uh, and you know, in many markets, eSports is already bigger than traditional sports. So that's what they understood. They, I wouldn't even say that they took a risk because it, would, it was pretty clear that it would succeed, but they, they took the jump, at least. Got it. Sort of leads to my next question. You know, if you're advising a brand, what's the best path for them? And what I mean by that is, you know, do you get behind a league like uh, Riot's League of Legends? Do you get behind a team like Complexity? Do you just go to Mike for specific pros and streamers? Uh, do you talk to Rishi because you're committing to his platform? How, how would you guys advise someone to think about the business? I would say have a value proposition first um, before you even select a platform overall. I think the examples that everybody used here of, of brand activations are great, but they're effectively applying kind of standard marketing practices towards esports in the same way that you would traditional sports. And I think what we need to see more of is things that are infrastructure focused. Um, you know, when you see things like what Microsoft's doing with Cloud9, where it's focused on CRM and building out something meaningful. And what are they doing with Cloud9? Yeah, so what the, it's, it's a standard team deal on, on one side, but then on the other side, of they're talking about building out CRM platforms so that you're better able to manage the direct relationships that you have with your fans across all of the different games. And I think that's a greater respect of the fact that there are different demographics and psychographics for each game and fan base. Um, and so I think that's what needs to happen first is don't just say you want to be in esports because you're talking about 30 different types of of fan bases, let's talk about what your true objective is and who you really want to reach. Um, and then it's a much easier conversation than saying something as, I mean, it's the equivalent of saying I want to be in sports. Um, and so I think we need to see a whole lot less of that and, and a whole lot more of knowing exactly what you're talking about as you approach it. Not to the point where you're spending $250,000 on research because it's all pretty public, um, but enough to, to be able to be armed with the information you need to approach the appropriate um, partners there. Got it. I mean, I'm biased. You can go with a team for sure. <laughs> and, and, and well, do you guys feel, like, how do you kind of process what Cam shared? I think what's interesting is that you got to understand, like Cam said, saying I want to get into sports is a very vague statement. It's the same way of saying I want to get into esports is incredibly vague. The audience segmentation is very different based off of the game you're looking at, based on the region you're looking at. So you really need to be clear about what you're trying to achieve and where you're trying to you know, focus. And then in addition to that, you should also think about the level of customization you're gonna get with things. I've noticed so far that you know, the level of creativity is still, there's room for improvement when it comes to doing things at the league or publisher and developer level, but then as you get, start going into teams or influencers, you have a lot more opportunity to lean more into the brand equity of these individuals or these teams and get more creative with the activations that you can do there. So I think it's dependent on where you wanna be, what area you're trying to focus on and what games you're looking at, uh, because you can't boil the ocean, that's just impossible. Yeah, yeah. I think uh, you know eSports has grown enough where we're now talking about you know, budgets larger than just test budgets. Um, you know, when you look at a normal brand like Coors Light, who's obviously just sponsored League of Legends uh, Championship Series, you know, when they approach sports, they look at football. They sponsor the league, then they do a massive media buy with Bleach Report, they do a massive buy with ESPN, and then they take a top player, make them the figure, and put them in all the commercials, and they loop in a full 360 strategy. You know, often too many times when a brand thinks about esports, they give all their money to a brand like Twitch, and they spread their money across 
any game mail 1834, which could be six or seven different games. If you look at sports and that strategy of like mail 1834, you will have your creative running against baseball, football, yeah. basketball, hockey. And so really it's about get, really getting granular into what an esports really is um, and trying to hit and identify which, that, which target market or target audience segment you're really going for. Is that, is that what you mean by the 360 approach? Yeah, it's, it's really taking the assets and really not just putting all your eggs in one basket, but really creating a strategy, kind of to Cam's point, of how do you touch, how do you touch uh, a fan of one certain esports, like a Fortnite fan or a CSGO fan, and hitting them throughout multiple frequencies, whether they're looking for content, whether they're looking for live gameplay, or whether they're just looking at Reddit and trying to find out what the other community members are, are speaking about the game that, that was like last night. Yeah, no, I, I have to agree with that. I mean, a lot of what we do is uh, agency work in esports, so it's a question that we get asked uh, uh, on, a, on a weekly uh, basis, but to me, the, the most interesting element is, you know, and I, I like the comparisons a lot. We like to say esports is like getting into esports, saying I want to be into music. There's a million genres, but the effect that the challenge a brand can have to get into it is, uh, you know, to feel disconnected. Right? We the term we use as a joke is uh, at the office is how do you do fellow kids? Right? It's People come in, they want to speak gamer, they want to speak esports, and sometimes you need to, of course, target, you know, interest based targeting your content and strategy. But I would say it's sometimes even better to, it's less detrimental to take content that exists and is true to itself and port it to esports than to try and do content for esports that doesn't resonate with esports. Ultimately, I think the four of us probably would agree in it that you know, the best is to create a piece of content strategy that is tailor-made for the market and tailor-made for the sub-market with an eSports, maybe on a platform with a team or with talent. Usually I'd say you should try and work with everything, but you can really p take your pick on where you want to start. And, and do you feel most um, sponsors are approaching it that way or half and half, or is it just starting to break with the idea of you know, that kind of 360 approach. Yeah, I mean, we were laughing just before this saying, you know, I, I, I want to take over esports is a phrase we use about every, we, we hear about every week. I mean, you can take over esports, it's going to cost a few billion dollars, but um, everything comes down to budget and marketing. You know, you, you can do something great. I mean, for example, we work with a lot of uh, grassroots communities whereby, like, in esports uh, bars and college campuses, esports organization, and that's what we do when you really want to put products into people's hands relatively and expensively. And at the complete other end, you know, we talk with leagues and, and Twitch and so on, and we're discussing seven-figure activations. So at the end of the day, there is a strategy for you in esports. Still, it's, I like to say that it's either at the bottom of the second or third, uh, top of the third inning. It's still relatively early in the game. There's a lot of things that are about to happen, but you have to realize that quite a few things have already happened. The game already has an identity, um, and it can swing one way or the other, but I don't know which point I'm making now. I'm just making seven points in one, in one time. Esports is fantastic. <laughs> Invest in it. That's my point. Yeah, I mean, the 360 approach, I think, works for a lot for CPG brands, especially in the the brands that want to basically, you know, hit 90% um, reach or anything like that. But you know, I think. You know, I usually take my hat off to the progressive marketers within the entertainment space. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of the theatricals, home entertainments, and TV shows, at least the progressive studios, are starting to really look at Twitch differently um, and really look at um, how to market their movies. Obviously, you know, you watch a UFC pay-per-view fight or you watch MA Finals, you'll see, you know, the next blockbuster hit running the trailers. Um, you're now starting to see a lot, especially with the Amazon Studios shows, like whether it's Jack Ryan, um, the Hunters that are coming out, or even the Expanse.